Let's turn back over to the book of Genesis. Are there any of you that this is your first service that you've been to during this series of meetings? Could I see your hand? Praise God. Appreciate you coming. I've been teaching on Joseph, and we started in Genesis chapter 37. I better not go back and repeat what I've been saying, or I'll preach it all, all over again. I feel like the things that I've been sharing are just real simple things. They're foundational things, but you know, it's things that most people don't get. I really feel like that during these, uh, we've already had three services. This is our fourth one during this weekend. I feel like one of the things that happens is as you focus on the Word of God and you see somebody in the Word of God who went through adversity that was worse than your adversity, and yet they come out victorious, it just builds hope on the inside of you that if they did it, I can do it. And it's amazing, all of these stories are in the Word of God for our edification to build us up, but yet the average Christian really does not dominate themselves with the Word of God. And the average Christian spends more time watching TV, watching movies, listening to junk than they do in the Word of God. And without realizing it, you may retain a story. You might be able to give me some of the uh, particulars about Joseph, but if you aren't thinking about it and focusing on it, your mind will be dominated by your dominant thought. And if you're listening to the junk of this world and all of these things, what happens is there is a negativism. There's a pe pessimism. A critical moan and groan and gripe type of attitude that is prevalent in our society. And, we're, and we just sometimes get inundated with it. We don't like it, but it just overwhelms us because that's what we focus our attention on. And by just focusing our attention on Joseph and talking about this, I believe that hope has been built on the inside of people. Man, it raises our expectation level. We see what God did with someone in the Old Testament and automatically it just begins to start producing hope on the inside of you. I think this has really stirred people up. And so I think that there's going to be good results out of it. The 37th chapter is where the story of Joseph begins, and it starts with him receiving a vision from God about the purpose for his life. You know, why didn't God just orchestrate everything and have all of these things work out in Joseph's life and it just come to pass? Why did he give him these dreams? What was the point of the dreams? He could have just, you know, had him sold into slavery and then had him put in the prison and then have him do all of these things, and he could have just maneuvered his life. See, a lot of people think that. Some people teach on the sovereignty of God that we're like a pawn and God just moves you around and it doesn't matter what happens. God is in control. That is absolutely not true. You know why God gave Joseph these dreams? Because if there hadn't have been a faith in his heart, a belief system that God had a purpose for him, if God hadn't have planted these seeds there and if he hadn't have been operating in faith... He would not have obtained this. He would have fallen out, by the way. I tell you, a dream, a, a sense of destiny, a sense of purpose is one of the most powerful forces in a person's life. When you have an expectancy about something coming to pass, a goal in front of you, it's one of the greatest things that you can have to keep you on track and keep you motivated. You know, I've got a purpose for my life. God's shown me things, and because of that, there's certain things I have to do to be able to service that and make sure I'm headed in that direction, and it keeps me on track. I can't imagine living your life ever since I was a little kid. I've known God had a purpose for my life, even before I knew what it was. You know, when I was five and six years old, I remember that I'd go out and lay in the backyard at night, and I would look up at the stars and try and put all this together. I heard that those things were millions of miles away, and yet I was seeing them. They were big, but they looked so small. I'd try and put all this together, and I'd wonder about, where did I come from? What's the purpose for my life? And I would lay out in the yard at night at four and five years old and think about that, and I remember my parents coming out and saying, what are you doing? And I told them I was just laying out here looking at the stars, and they thought it was weird. My parents started telling me, stop doing that. And I had to go out, and I had, to, I had places in our yard where I hid so I could just lay down at night and look at the stars and wonder about what's happening. Some of you think that's weird, but I bet you that every one of you at one time in your life had those same questions you had this same thing. It's like a homing device that God puts on the inside of you. God is trying to direct you, but we get busy, we get friends, we turn it off, we deaden ourselves to it. 
But God tries to speak to every single person. I just, for whatever reason, begin to listen to it. And I have lived my entire life knowing that I had a purpose for my life. I knew that. And I, even when I didn't know what it was, I knew that I was in preparation. I just can't imagine living your life getting up, going to work, coming home, watching TV, going to bed, getting up, going to work, coming home, and not having a clue what your life is all about. Boy, to me, no wonder people are depressed. If you don't have a purpose, if you don't feel like your life is worth something and you've got a purpose and a direction for your life, no wonder people struggle. I tell you, God's got a purpose for every single person, and before you can obtain that, God has to start revealing that purpose to you. If you don't know what God's will for your life is, you may not know all of the particulars, but if you don't have a direction for your life, I tell you, you shouldn't be doing anything until you get a direction for your life. God wants you to know it more than you want to know it. So God planted this dream in Joseph's life, and that started him on the path that he was on. And God did that because he had to maintain it by faith. He had a goal that he was shooting for, and because of that, he was able to serve God even when things got bad. So he began to speak his vision. His brothers got jealous of him. They sold him into slavery. And we talked about in chapter 39, verse 2, that when he was standing on an auction block, stripped naked, God said he was a prosperous man. Prosperity isn't all of these assets, things that we talk about. Prosperity is having God with you, having God for you, God's favor on your behalf. And the truth is, every one of us that have been born again, God is for you. God is out to prosper you. There is a supernatural anointing flowing that if you would just cooperate, it would be like a flood that would just pick you up and sweep you along and things in your life would begin to work. You have to do things to stop God's blessing in your life. And the sad thing is most of us are doing a lot to stop God's blessing. Our, our whining, our griping, our complaining, our selfishness, our looking at ourselves, our unbelief, our fear unforgiveness, all of these things stop the flow of God. But you know what? If we would just cooperate with God, God is with every one of us. Every one of us is a very, very, very prosperous person. You were created with certain purposes and designs, and God wants you to prosper. So the 39th chapter shows Joseph cooperating. Here he is sold into slavery, and yet he serves his master. And because he had a good attitude, and instead of griping and complaining, he was still believing God, God promoted him. And for nearly ten years, he stayed in his master's house. He was faithful, faithful, faithful. What did it get him? The master's wife began to try and entice him, and because he rejected her, she accused him of rape, and he got thrown into prison. He was completely innocent in the deal, and yet his faithfulness didn't look like it had done anything good for him. And so in prison, and we talked about this last night, and these are some of the scriptures that I love. Joseph was in prison ministering to people to such a degree that he walked in, in uh, Genesis chapter 40 and verse 7, and he said unto the uh, two officers of Pharaoh, he says, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? Man, I love that. Here they are in prison. And it was unusual for people to be sad. You know what? Joseph had turned that whole prison around. Joseph was serving them. It says up in verse 4 that he served these prisoners. God promoted him. He became the absolute head over the entire prisons. Everything that happened, happened under his hand. The, the officer of the prison didn't even know what was going on. God blessed him even in a situation where most people would think this is so insignificant. Here I am in prison. Who's ever going to see what I do? Most people would just literally throw up their hands and sit there and whine, gripe and complain, be in depression, and they would have missed the blessing of God. You know, if Joseph hadn't have been faithful in that prison, if he hadn't have served in that prison to people who were rejects, people who were prisoners, if he hadn't have served the basically the, the scum of society, did you know what? God's purposes and plans for him wouldn't have come to pass or they would have had to happen some other way, not the way that the scripture talks about. This is how God blessed him. And you know, many times we're put in positions where we just think it's insignificant, 
This isn't important. I'm going to wait until something important comes along before I really operate in integrity, before I really give myself to this. And you're going to miss God if you do that. You've got to recognize that, man, God evaluates you and sees how you fulfill things. If you aren't faithful in that which is least, God will not make you ruler over much. We have people come to our Bible college all of the time who are wanting God to do something special in their life. But you know what? They won't go to the rescue mission that we sponsor and minister to the drug addicts and the drunks and the prostitutes. That's beneath them. They won't go into a church and work in the nursery. They won't work with the youth. They won't clean the church. They won't clean the toilets. They've, they're an apostle. I don't doubt that God calls apostles today. I believe there are apostles, but you know what? If you aren't willing to start cleaning the toilets and changing diapers and ministering to people where they are, you're never going to grow into that. You know, I don't believe you start as an apostle. I could get off and teach on this. But you earn. It's like you don't start as the CEO. You start and work your way up. It is a promotion. Nobody starts as an apostle. Now, I believe you may have a calling on you to be an apostle from the beginning, but when you first start in ministry, you are not an apostle. You're a teacher or a prophet or you're something else, and you work your way up. You might be called to be an apostle, but you aren't functioning as one until you have started other works, until there are people that are looking to you for leadership, until you're like the father of these other works. It's like a man, you know, he may be called to be a father and someday he's going to be a father and he may be married and he may be on his way, but if he doesn't have any kids, he's not a father yet. An apostle is descriptive of a function. And you know what, many people are just wanting to start at the top and enter at this entry level where you are already in command. It doesn't happen like that. You've got to be faithful in a few things. You've got to be faithful on your job. You've got to be faithful with your kids. You've got to be faithful where you are. You've got to serve as if this was it and they aren't ever going to get any promotion above this. I see people that are kind of like saving themselves up for when it really counts. You know what? If that's your attitude, then you're never going to get that opportunity. You've got to give it like there is no tomorrow. You've got to serve people as if this is the last place you'll ever be. That's one of the lessons you learn from Joseph. This man was faithful, 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 even in the prison. He was serving people. He interpreted these two dreams, and sure enough, it came to pass exactly the way he interpreted to him. He told them, remember me when you stand before Pharaoh, but they forgot. And Joseph could have gotten really upset over this. Joseph could have really whined and complained and said, man, look, I promoted this person. It was because of my dream and all of these things, and nobody appreciates me. But Joseph just stayed steady. So we see in the 41st chapter of Genesis that after two full years, Pharaoh dreamed a dream, and it begins to tell the dream. I'm not going to read this first part because he tells his dream again, and it would be repetitious. But he dreams this dream, and at the end of telling of his dream, it says in verse 8, that it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward with the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief uh, baker, And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there a young man, an Hebrew servant, to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. So here it is, two full years later, Pharaoh is seeking for an interpretation, and finally the butler says, Oh, now I remember Joseph. You know what? There's so many things I could say about this. I've got to move on. But I'm telling you, God rewards faithfulness. And it doesn't come just automatically. 
Like if you do the right thing today, you might be fired tomorrow. And some people think, well, no, the God didn't reward me. No, it will be rewarded. All of this is going to be sorted out. Righteousness exalts a nation. It may not look like it at the exact moment, but you know what? The end result of living righteousness is that it is going to promote you. It's going to bless you. God is going to prosper you. I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of times. I could name a dozen right off the top of my head that people have come out against me and criticized me. I've been kidnapped. I've been threatened to be killed. I've had guns pulled on me. I've had a lot of things happen. I've had people blast me. I've had people say I'm the slickest cult since Jim Jones come out on television and fight against me. I've had a lot of opposition against me. And you know what? I've just chosen to walk in love with these people. And I have seen God turn it around time after time after time after time. I have seen, sometimes it's five, ten years. I've got one deal I'm working on right now. The person who went on national television and said I was the slickest cult, probably every person in here knows who this person is. And you know what? I just love them. I've sent them offerings. I've ministered with them at conferences. And I've, we've both been together. And I just blessed this person. I've never spoken against them. And they still hadn't apologized. But it, it's we're working on it. It'll come to pass. Amen. <laughs> I've seen it happen so many times. God has made people eat their words. If you just would stay steady, you know what? God will reward you. And even if it never came to pass in this life, there's going to come a day we stand before God and God's going to sort all of this out. I can promise you that every wrong is going to be righted. Righteousness will... Those who are righteous will shine as the sun. If you do what's right, God is going to reward you. And it may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but it will happen. God will make it work. I remember this one man, there was a full gospel businessman's group in Lamar, Colorado, where I was, and it's a long story. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. You know, I've grown a lot. I'm a lot nicer now than I used to be, <laughs> believe it or not. I used to just fight, boy, and I mean, I'd fight at the drop of a hat, and I'd drop my hat to get to fight. And uh, anyway, in Lamar, Colorado, I butted head with a number of people. And because of this, the full gospel ministry, I'd go to their meetings every month and I'd sit down at a table and the whole table would get up and move. They'd just leave me. <laughs> the uh, director of the full gospel ministry, I'd go up to shake his hand and he'd just cross his hands like this. They wouldn't even talk to me. They hated me. They told me they didn't want me to come. And I'd come and bring my Bible study groups to the full gospel thing. And I just love those people. Never criticized them. Anyway, did you know that Mel Tari came one time? And when Mel Tari came, they had the guy who was over seven states of uh, full gospel businessmen. And he came, and it turned, it's a long story, but it turned out that I knew his daughter. His daughter had ministered for me one time, and he had been so blessed by it. That, he, that You know, the full gospel businessmen, they really spend 30 minutes telling you who this person is, how important they is. They're really into all that kind of stuff. So they built this guy up as the slickest thing since sliced bread, and everybody was just awestruck that this man was there to introduce Mel Tari. And the first thing he did was get up and say, Man, I see Andrew Womack out there. You are so blessed to have Andrew Womack in your town. And he spent... <laughs> He spent 10 minutes praising me in front of these people, and you should have seen it. After that, all of these full gospel leaders came up and hugged me, and, oh, we're so glad to have you here, and I just wanted to punch their lights out, you know what? But what I'm saying is, you know, God just rubbed their nose in it. The very person that they disliked, he just put me in a position, and one of those... Uh, officers of that full gospel businessman group wasn't there that night. And anyway, he had criticized me and spoken about me many, many times. And then I was in, I moved to Colorado Springs and in Colorado Springs, Joe Nay, the man who got me started, was speaking at a full gospel businessman's convention. And for seven days, one solid week, twice a day, Joe Nay got up and he would say, man, Andrew Womack, we used to be good friends together. I'm the one that helped get him started. And he just spoke nice things about me. And finally, the last night, on Friday night, there was probably six, 700 people there. A man came up while Joe had me up on the platform and saying these things and having me give testimonies about what God was doing. 
and a man came up and literally ran and fell at my feet and started crying and hugging my feet. And I said, what's the deal? And he says, I have told people you're of the devil. I have told people to burn your tapes and books. I have hated you for years. I've never meant you, but I've hated you, and I've said all of these things. And he says, this is the fifth night this week I've heard Joe Nay talk about you, and he says, I just can't get it. He says, forgive me. And this guy came and fell at my feet and asked me to forgive him. I'd never even seen the guy. I didn't even know what he had done. And yet, you know what? God worked it out. I could go on and on and on and on. And you know what? If you'll just do what's right, God will take care of you. It may take five years, ten years. But I'm telling you, uh, Joseph is a great example. This man just stayed faithful, stayed faithful, stayed faithful. Thirteen years, everything in his life looked like it was going wrong, and yet he just stayed faithful. He kept doing what God told him to do. He held on to the vision. He served people. He wasn't whining and griping and complaining. He wasn't self-centered. He was thinking about somebody else. And eventually, they said, I do remember my faults today. And God turned this situation around. Joseph was in the pit, in prison, and in an hour, he came out and was the ruler over the entire land, over the mightiest nation on the face of the earth. Only God can do that. You know, God can change your situation just like that. It doesn't take an instant. You could be poor and you could be a millionaire by this time tomorrow if you don't quit and give up. God could turn all of your situations around. You can be sick right this moment and in an instant you can be absolutely ill. Man, we just have to learn to keep doing what's right. What's the alternative? It's like Jesus told Peter, he says, are you going to leave me also? And he says... Where else can I go? I thought about it. There's nowhere else to go. <laughs> Lord, you have the words of eternal life. And you know what? There's times that all of us, it looks like nothing's ever going to work. And you just have to keep keeping on. You have to stay on track. You have to keep doing what's right. And you have to have this firm conviction that eventually right is going to win over wrong. Godliness will overcome ungodliness. It'll work. We've got history to prove it. You, you know, if you just took a snapshot of history, you could look at things like during the Second World War, the Holocaust, and you could think, well, boy, right didn't win out. If you just take a snapshot of a little inc- instance, like looking at one family or something, you might say something like that. But overall, in the history of the world, did you know what? That there have been ungodly people rise and fall, and yet godliness wins out. God has overcome those things. God is moving. There is a reward for the righteous. And again, there's going to be some things that we don't ever see work out in this life, but when we stand before God, everything's going to be put in its proper order. Well, you need to hear things like this because our society today, did you know that even the movies, it used to be that the good guys won. The guy in the white hat won. Now it is very unusual for the good guy to win. They're nearly all tragedies to where something works out and and the bad guys win and all these kind of things. But I tell you, in the Word of God, in, in reality, the good guys always win. They don't always win in this life, but we are going to stand before God and God is going to reward you and the people who have lived righteously are going to shine as the sun. And the evil people that are being exalted and promoted today are going to be put down. And I tell you, you've got to have that knowledge and that confidence. You've got to believe in right. Amen? Amen? And that's a powerful truth. I could preach on that a long time. Look in verse 14. It says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. This is a small thing, but it's a big thing. Do you know, Joseph realized that, man, here it is. Here's my vision coming to pass. It's going to happen. He had been standing for 13 years. And you know what he did? He shaved himself and cleaned up and wore some nice clothes and went in to see Pharaoh. This is a small thing, but again, we have people come to our Bible college, especially the younger people, they just dress sloppy. 
Now, I'm not a, you know, a big person on wearing three-piece suits, and I'm not saying that we have to abide by X standard, but I am saying that, you know what, you ought to at least smell decent so that people aren't turned off. You ought to at least have your hair combed. We have people come in. I had somebody come for a job interview that some of you will think this is terrible, but I told them, I said, I don't want you. Well, look at what I can do. And I said, I don't care what you can do. Look at how you look. You know what? If you don't care any more about yourself than that, you aren't the type of person I want working for me. Some people think that's prejudice. I guarantee you, if you're an employer, you can tell something about a person. It doesn't tell you everything. You can't just, you know, some people clean up nice and they can dress nice and inside they're a mess. I'm not saying that just your dress tells everything, but it is an indication. And some of the younger people today will say, well, you're prejudiced. You're just a bigot. You judge people on the outward appearance. Well, to a degree, yes, I do. Your outward appearance says something. You know, I go into hospitals and pray for a lot of people. And when you see a person that even though they're dying, the doctor tells them it's bad, they still fix their hair. They still have a little bit of pride in the way they look. You know what? That's encouraging to me. And I know that that person still values life and stuff. But when you see a person that's just totally gone, they don't take care of themselves, it's, it says volumes. I'm not trying to make more out of this than what it is, but I tell our Bible college students, if you're going to go apply for a job, you don't have to wear a suit necessarily, but at least wear something clean, at least look nice, at least comb your hair, brush your teeth, put a breath mint in. (laughs) And you know what? Some of you think, well, that's not important. It is important. You haven't woken up to reality yet. There's very few people that are going to judge you on the basis of who you are in the Spirit. Most people are going to look at you carnally, and if you are a mess, it's going to make an influence on how they respond to you. Amen. And you see, Joe, this is just a person with an attitude of excellence. A person with an attitude of excellence is going to care about their appearance. Again, I don't always dress up fancy. Sometimes I look like a mess because I've been out riding my bike or jogging or doing something. But you know what? You need to at least uh, do some necessary things. You need to have a spirit of excellence. And if you have it, it'll show up in the way you present yourself. Amen or oh me. I know some of you are thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Well, it's just a small thing, but it's an indicator that here's a man who for 13 years had had everything in his life go wrong. He'd been living in a prison for over two years, probably three or four years. This guy had been in terrible adversity, in terrible situations, and yet when he got an opportunity, he shaved himself, he cleaned up, and he began to present himself. It says a lot about this guy and and how he saw himself. Amen or oh me. That's good preaching. So in verse 15, Pharaoh said, you know, this is amazing that Pharaoh even asked him to come. Here's a guy who interpreted some dreams. And so he's going to have him come and do this. this. It's a supernatural thing. God moved upon people's hearts. God is going to have to move on other people's hearts to help you fulfill your vision. Nobody's going to get your vision fulfilled totally by yourself. And you know what? You need to recognize that, man, it's important how other people perceive you. And you need to cooperate and at least give God something to work with. Amen. In verse 15, it says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream. There is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, answered Pharaoh, saying, is, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know, Joseph, it wasn't himself that he had confidence in. It wasn't self-confidence. It was God-confidence. It was because of his relationship with God. Everything in Joseph's life centered around his relationship with God. Did you know those of you who are very talented and have great skills and you're highly educated and you can just do multiple things, anything you set your hand unto prospers. In a sense, I feel sorry for you. Because you know what? That makes it very easy for you to trust in yourself. But when you're a hick from Texas, you know that, man, it's got to be God. And that's a good place to be. 
I had a person come up to me one time and says, how come God uses Hicks from Texas the way that he does? And he put me in the category of Hagen and Copeland, which I thought was a great compliment. And I said, it's because Hicks from Texas know that they need help. Those of you that got it all together, thank God you just get me introduced and I can handle it from here. That's the reason the Bible says God has chosen the weak things of the world and foolish things of the world and base things of the world and things that are despised and things that are nothing to bring to naught things that are, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. The reason God chose the, the people who aren't recognized is because those people know that God, it can't be me, it's got to be you and that's what God's looking for. God's not against people that have it together. It's just that people that have it together aren't God-dependent. Joseph here, this is an important statement by him. He says, it's not in me. I don't have any virtue. Here he is, 13 years of being in the pit, 13 years of everything going wrong. This is his one chance to make his case. And instead of promoting himself and saying, oh man, have you come to the right guy? I am, I'm awesome. Wait until you hear what I've got to do. He wasn't blowing his own horn. He says, it's not me, but it's God. He all, his confidence, everything that he had was in his dependence and reliance upon God. Boy, if we could learn to do that, your life would turn around on a dime. I called a woman one time and I said, how are you? And she says, oh, I'm weak in him. And I thought, what does that mean? But you know, I got to thinking about it and I said, man, that's pretty good. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I have no confidence in the flesh, then I have all of the confidence in God. I've seen this in my own life. When I've done everything right, when it seems like everybody you touch gets healed and you've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open, you know what? That's when you're your most vulnerable. Because if you aren't careful, you'll get to thinking, look what I've done. And the moment you do that, you're headed for failure. But you know, when I've just blown it some way or another and I'm standing up here in front of people thinking, oh God, I'm not worthy to be up here. Oh God, just, I'm trusting Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's when I see my greatest miracles because that's when my faith is 100% in Jesus. Y'all don't look at me in that tone of voice like you never do this stuff. (laughs) You do the same thing. When you're your strongest is when you're your weakest. He says, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And so Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind. Let me just summarize this. There came up seven cows that were well-developed and fat, and then after them there came up seven lean cows that were so skinny it looked like they were about to die. And the skinny cows ate up the fat cows. Then he woke up and he had a second dream. And in the second dream, he saw seven ears of corn. And the first ears of corn were just perfect and beautiful. And then there came up seven ears of corn that were blasted and destroyed and they were um, no good. And the seven skinny ears ate up the seven fat ears. And so he awoke and he says, this is my dream. And here's what Joseph said unto him in verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that reason was... Uh, doubled, the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. So that's the dream and that's the interpretation of the dream. I tell you, this is just God. And uh, again, it goes back to when Joseph was 17 years old, God gave him a dream and interpreted that. This had been a constant way of God speaking to Joseph. And here again, this is the third dream that we've heard repeated 
uh, that he's interpreted. Actually, it was the third instance. There were two dreams with the butler and the baker. But this is something that Joseph was familiar with. God used the anointing that was already functional in his life to be the thing that promoted him. So that was the dream in the interpretation thereof. And then in verse 33 it says, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. This was a 20% tax. Pretty hefty tax. But this was the instruction of God through uh, Joseph. In verse 35, And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the, in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Man, this is amazing. You know, we just read through these things quickly, but think of this. Here's a guy who's been in prison, and he walks into the court of Pharaoh, interprets a dream. This didn't take over five minutes. In five minutes, he interprets the dream, says, here's the way that you should deal with this, appoint this man, do these things. And Pharaoh, the mightiest man on the face of the earth at that time, the strongest nation on the earth, he just says... You have to be that man. There's none so discreet as you. God showed you this, so you've got to be the wisest man. I'll make you in charge. That is absolutely amazing. That would be, that would be equal today for the president, just having somebody, you know, who's a bum, sitting on the street outside of the White House, and somebody says, man, this guy's awesome. You ought to go see him. And he shaves himself, cleans up, walks in, and the president just promotes him and says... Man, you're my vice president. You're going to control everything. You're going to be the second in command. It's amazing. It's unprecedented. This has to be the favor and the anointing of God. And I guarantee you, things like this don't happen accidentally. If Joseph hadn't have been faithful with Potiphar and have believed and have seen that situation turn around. And if he hadn't have been faithful in the prison and seen that situation turned around, if he hadn't have developed that, he never would have been given this kind of an opportunity. I tell you, his faithfulness in those seemingly unimportant situations were critical, absolutely critical to what went on. And so in verse 40 it says, Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. Boy, the contrast of this, just an hour or two earlier, here's Joseph in the prison. And now he's dressed in fine linen clothes, gold, silver, given a wife. All of these things happen. Man, don't you know that that was a little hard to handle? But you know what? A person who had been faithful in the prison for 13 years had been faithful in those hardships. I guarantee you he, he can handle prosperity. Most of us want this kind of prosperity and recognition and stuff, but if you haven't been faithful to God when your back's against the wall, you won't be faithful to God when all the restraints are taken off and everything is available to you. In verse uh, 43, it says, And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Man, imagine being a prisoner with no responsibility, nothing, and then all of a sudden nobody can lift his hand or foot without your permission. Isn't that awesome? God can turn your situation around in a heartbeat. Man, some of you look like you're at the end of your rope, it's a good place. 
That's a good place. That means that you got nowhere else to go. That means that the breakthrough's got to be right around the corner. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. When you get to a place that, oh God, I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand another 10 minutes. Stand 11. Because if nothing else, the default will take over. You can't go beyond what you can stand. And so the moment it gets unbearable, your breakthrough is right around the corner. Man, this is awesome. Look in verse uh, 46, and it says, And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he was 17 years old in Genesis 37, 2, when these dreams came. This meant that it was 13 years before the first positive thing happened towards his vision. I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but man, I can relate to this. God called me to minister the Word and immediately put in my heart that I was going to be doing things. I've known I was going to be on radio and television. Right after I first got turned on to the Lord, I heard a song on the radio, and I told people, I said, that's the song I'll use on my radio broadcast. And I'd only been turned on to the Lord for a year or less, and I was already dreaming of a radio broadcast, preaching the truth, seeing people's lives changed. That happened in 1968, And I started on radio, it would have been in 1976, and then started on television in 2000. You know what, that's been a long time coming. And during that period of time, there's been a number of steps that God led me to take. For the first time in Childress, Texas, we finally had enough people coming that we were eating on a regular basis. It was awesome. I went nearly 10 years on the verge of starving to death. And we finally had enough people coming. We had 60 or 70 people in that church, and we were eating, and I could see light at the end of the tunnel, and it wasn't a train. (laughs) You know what? For the first time, it looked like things were going to work out in my life, and praise God, the vision was going to come to pass. And right in the midst of that, I went to Colorado Springs, and on my way through, I stopped in a little place called Kim, Colorado, met a man who I led into the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 15 years before, this guy said, there's a Bible study I pastor in Pritchett, Colorado. You ought to go over and minister to them. And I said, well, sure, I'll go over there. Those people had been told Hagen and Copeland were of the devil. Miracles didn't happen today. They burnt faith books and renounced them as being of the devil. I went over there into this hostile situation. People got mad at me. It was That's where they threatened to kill me. And all these things happened. And, uh, but we saw a man raised from the dead in Pritchett, Colorado. And it just kind of stopped everybody's mouth. (laughs) They were saying this stuff didn't happen, and we saw a guy raised from the dead, and they had to admit it did happen. And so I finished my five-day meeting, and I was leaving, and the elders of that church came to me, and they said, you can't leave us. And I said, I'm out of here. I don't know if you've ever seen Pritchett, Colorado, but... If it's not the end of the world, you can see it from there. It is that close. There isn't a tree in the whole county except in that town. It is flat. It is desolate. Pritchett, Colorado had 144 people in it. The church that we met in was an old storefront cinder block thing that didn't have a roof on it. In Colorado, that's not good. This was not God. I just knew that I wasn't supposed to stay there. But they said, you came in here, you've challenged all of our theology, you've turned everything upside down, and now you're just going to leave us? You can't do this. And I said, bye. (laughs) I got in my car and headed back to Texas, and on the way, God spoke to me and told me I was supposed to go to Pritchett, Colorado. And man, I felt like rebuking it, but I knew it was God. (laughs) And within a month, I was living in Pritchett, Colorado. And when I went there, did you know, honestly, I thought, God, Pritchett, Colorado is not a stepping stone to any place. (laughs) There was only 10 people in the church, only 144 people in the whole town. You know what? The only way you leave Pritchett, Colorado is feet first. (laughs) And I thought, God, I'll follow you, and if it means... Dying to my vision, I don't care. I'm going to do what you told me to do. And I went to Pritchett, Colorado, and I enjoyed being there. 
And we saw that church grow from 10 to 100 people in six months. We had 100 out of 144 coming. I loved it. I got to where I loved Pritchett, Colorado. And you know, now I look back, I can't see how God would have moved in my life without going through Pritchett. That's where people heard me on the radio. That's where I went on the radio. A guy came to Pritchett. And anyway, things happened that couldn't have happened if I hadn't have been there. It's just like being in the prison. How else would God have got him in touch with the butler and the baker? I don't know how it worked, but it didn't look like a good thing. But you know what? Obeying God is always the right thing to do. Following God. And I promise you that there were times that it looked like I was never going to see anybody come to our meetings. We weren't going to reach people. But you know what? It's beginning. We're beginning to see the power of God. And now other people are saying, oh, yeah, but where were they when I needed them? Amen. Where were they when I was in prison? There was nobody, nobody saying you'll ever get out of town alive. I can relate. I can relate to uh, Joseph. But you know, as good as this is up to this point, he was 30 years old, 13 years of adversity. I'm just going to have to summarize something, then we'll finish up tonight. But you know, the greatest miracle in all of Joseph's life, you think that being faithful up until this point, 13 years of being sold into slavery, put in prison, lied about, neglected, abused, all of these things, We think that that is a great testimony. You know, the greatest testimony to Joseph is, and I'll show you these scriptures tonight, Joseph came to the throne when he was 30 years old. He was uh, 37, 39 years old when his brothers came and wanted to buy food. That means that he lasted through the seven years of plenty and two years of famine as absolute ruler of Egypt, control of the military, he could have done anything he wanted. And for nine years after he had absolute power, he still trusted in God and didn't do one thing to make that dream come to pass. That's the greatest testimony about Joseph. Now again, some people will serve God when their back's against the wall because what option do we have? Quit and give up. Some people will think, boy, when you're under pressure, this really tells you what you're made of. And when you're squeezed, we'll find out what's inside of you. No, the truth is, you know, the greatest test of your character that you'll ever have is not hardship, not problems. And this may shock some of you, but if you're struggling to stay faithful in hardship, you'll never, never, never stay faithful in prosperity. Prosperity is infinitely a greater test of your strength and character than hardship because in hardship, even people that have a small commitment to the Lord know, God, this is bigger than me. God, I can't handle it. God, I've got to have you. When is it that most of you pray the most? When your back's against the wall, when you're in trouble? Because when you're in trouble, you know you need help. But what happens when you're blessed and everything's going good? That's the greatest test of your character that there is. Joseph was the mightiest man in all of Egypt. He could have taken the military. He could have gone down and have surrounded his brothers and his father and have pointed a weapon at them and say, bow the knee. And he could have made the vision come to pass. And yet Joseph didn't do one thing to make what God had shown him come to pass in his natural self. He stayed faithful in prosperity for nine years after he could have done anything. Most of us, if you would have remained faithful through 13 years of slavery and prison, I guarantee you the moment you had the power, you would have run down there and you'd have made your siblings bow the knee. You would have made this vision come to pass. Amen or oh me. I know some of y'all are thinking, oh, not me. (laughs) I tell you what, that's the way most of us would be. Most of us, man, the moment we have the opportunity, we're going to make things come to pass. We're going to take charge. But Joseph, when he didn't have any choice, remained faithful to God. And when he did have a choice and he could have done anything he wanted, he still remained faithful. 